Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I am Brooke Clement, and I am the director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum. And I am happy to welcome you to this great program we've got for you tonight. Um, before we begin, I do want to ask that you all check your phones and make sure that they're on silent. Um, so, just a reminder too that next Thursday, Reverend Robert Jones will be back and performing on our stage. Uh, last year's performance was amazing, so if you missed it, you don't want to miss it this year. Um, in addition, we are partnering with the World Affairs Council and will serve as host to their Great Decisions series every Tuesday evening in February and March. So that, that if you need any information on those uh, programs or events, those are on our website. And I just again, want to continue to thank you all for all of your support. We couldn't do it without you and our great partners at the foundation as well. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Joel Westfall, the deputy director here at the Library Museum. He's gonna introduce our guests this evening and have a great talk. Thanks. Good evening. So tonight, uh, we have someone with us here who is a absolute and true friend uh, to the National Archives and Records Administration, as well as to the Gerald R. Ford Foundation. How true a friend is Garrett Graff? Well, just to put it in a kind of small perspective, Garrett is such a friend that when Garrett writes out his check every year uh, to the IRS, <laughs> Garrett loves to believe that every single cent comes to the National Archives for our usage. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I'm not sure that is true, Garrett. In fact, it probably goes to like the tail hook of an F-35 but my friend, it's, it's the thought that counts. Ladies and gentlemen, Garrett Graff. Yeah, um, Joel just stole what is normally my opening joke when I uh, speak at a presidential library or museum, which is uh, I'm just a huge fan of the presidential libraries and uh, museums across the country, and I've been lucky enough, I think I've done uh, research now at all but three of them, and uh, it's, they're just a, a really wonderful uh, network across the country and, and resource for history. So I'm very appreciative of Thank the you work so much. that archivists do across the country. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Garrett. So you started out uh, by writing uh, a book about Robert Mueller and the FBI, getting yourself a kind of sweet gig on CNN, a lot of a national exposure. Uh, you moved from that um, to writing my personal favorite, Raven Rock, uh, the, the story of the US government's plan uh, to save itself while the rest of us die. And you followed th that up with the, in my opinion, one of the best oral histories editorial ever written in The Only Plane in the Sky, the story of 9-11. And then, not on that success, you moved and wrote one of 2023's um, Pulitzer Prize nominated his history of the history of Watergate. And last, a couple years ago, you were here to talk about your Watergate book. And I, I fully remember this. You and I were having a private dinner across the river and I, every, every time you've been here, I usually ask you, so Garrett, what's next? And your response was, I'm writing a book on UFOs. <laughs> and I know my response was, what? <laughs> so Garrett, why UFOs? Um, as you say, uh, uh, I'm a very weird person to have written this book because I am not a uh, I was not raised watching the X-Files or, or Star Trek. Um, I'm not a 
uh, sci-fi aficionado. Uh, I, I come at this book, as you just outlined, as someone who has covered national security for the last 20 years. Um, and what I noticed in Washington in the last couple of years was the conversation around UFOs changed and that there was a series of blockbuster reporting by uh, the New York Times and Politico, where I used to work, uh, uh, in the fall of 2017 that outlined sort of two threads of a changing perspective on UFOs. One was a series of reports about a, a secret Pentagon UFO study program that had been funded by then uh, Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid and had been run by a Las Vegas businessman and space entrepreneur uh, named Robert Bigelow. And at the same time, there were a series of videos that came out that the Pentagon released from Navy pilots, Navy aviators, who had encounters with objects in the sky that they could not explain. And there were a series of three videos that came out. Um, the, the aviators, the pilots, uh, sort of testified about these encounters, said it was you know, technology that they did not understand, that they did not believe that the U.S. could counter and things that moved at speeds and in angles that def to them defied physics as we understood it. And that was interesting. Um, but then there was a moment for me in December 2020 that took this from a, uh, you know, something I was sort of vaguely paying attention to to something where I was like, okay, I should sit down and dive into this for a, a book project which was John Brennan, uh, who had just wrapped up the better part of a decade at that point as the CIA director and the White House Homeland Security Advisor, gave an interview to a DC journalist named Tyler Cowen, where he said, in essence, in, in incredibly tortured syntax, there's some stuff out there, we don't know what it is, it puzzles us, and it may represent a phenomenon that some might say might constitute a new form of life. And that's an incredibly weird statement for someone like John Brennan to make. Um, I had covered John Brennan. I've interviewed John Brennan. Um, he's about as serious a... Uh, national security establishment person as, uh, as you can get. And I figured there can't be that many things that puzzle John Brennan. Like when he woke up in the morning and he was CIA director and White House Homeland Security Advisor, if he had a question, we have a $60 billion a year intelligence apparatus that went out and tried to answer his questions. And, you know, there are spies and analysts and special operators and satellite surveillance networks and signals intelligence intercept systems, all dedicated to answering whatever random questions John Brennan wakes up in the morning with. <laughs> and so if he is leaving office at the end of eight years as White House Homeland Security Advisor and, uh, and CIA Director, and he says, man, this UFO stuff is really puzzling. Um, that, to me, felt like something that was worthy of diving into deeper. And so this book tries to pull together two threads that journalists and historians normally treat differently. One, that's the military's hunt for UFOs here on Earth. And then the evolving science and astronomy around our understanding of the size and scale and scope of the universe and what astronomers call the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI. And that journalists and historians normally try to treat these as like two totally separate 
unrelated topics. You know, you have the wacky UFO people here who are all crazy. And then you have the serious astronomers doing serious astronomy work studying the universe. But to me, it's very much the same history, um, in part because you see the same figures sort of moving back and forth between these two worlds and arguing with one another, but then also at an incredibly basic level, the question of are aliens visiting us here on Earth has a lot to do with the question of whether aliens exist at all. Thank you, Garrett. So before I answer, I uh, ask, uh, ask my next question, um, I want to do a quick audience poll because it leads into question number two. So here, here is the poll. How many of you believe that UFOs exist, but they are not of alien nature? Raise your hand. Not of alien nature. Not. Okay. How many of you believe that UFOs exist and they are of alien nature, please raise your hand. Okay, all right. And here's the last one. How many of you did not raise your hands because you are concerned about being stigmatized one way or the other? <laughs> all right, that's a, very fair, that's a very fair raising of your hand. So Garrett, uh, in your book, you write quite a bit about the scientific community early on in the UFO experience, right after, the, right after World War II. And scientists are like common human psychology. They're saying one thing in public, but they're saying something else entirely in private. Can you expound on that, please? Yeah, so the modern flying saucer age begins in the summer of 1947. Um, and it was an Idaho businessman named Kenneth Arnold in June 1947 who was flying his private plane up in the Pacific Northwest in the Cascades, and he sees out his window nine saucer-shaped objects moving at tremendous speed. He lands, tells some friends about it on the ground, it gets picked up by the media, um, the media... Uh, sensationalizes this, and it kicks off the summer of the flying saucer. Flying saucers are entirely new to American culture at that point. Um, and over the course of that summer, it, there are sightings across 34 states up into North America, you know, a sighting almost every day in the country. There are, uh, you know, this is like front page newspaper, stories day after day after day that summer. Two weeks into this phenomenon, uh, there's a crash in Roswell, New Mexico that becomes part of the lure of this flying saucer. And in that early moment, there's no one who thinks that these are aliens. And what the government is deeply concerned about is that this is secret Soviet spacecraft being built by kidnapped Nazi rocket scientists. <laughs> because what is the United States doing in the summer of 1947? This is the dawn of the Cold War. This is actually the summer when the Cold War, in some ways, sort of peaks in its early years. That You have the passage of the National Security Act of 1947 almost the same day as the Roswell crash. The, this is the act that creates the CIA, creates the Joint Chiefs of Staff, creates the Defense Department, creates the Air Force as an independent military branch, uh, creates the National Security Council. You know, the whole U.S. government is sort of reshaping itself for the, the Cold War. And we, uh, we would use a word, different word than kidnapped. Uh, we would tell you that we had presented some unique employment opportunities to former Nazi rocket scientists uh, in places like Los Alamos and the White Sands Proving Grounds. And we're having them build, you know, the next generation of V2 rockets to help launch the, the space race. And so the 
you know, the Air Force as a independent service, its first crisis is these flying saucers, and it needs to figure out what these things are, and are they a threat to national security? And they are just as baffled as anyone else in the summer of 47. And eventually, they figure out it's not secret Soviet spacecraft. And in a very weird way, the U.S. government and the U.S. Air Force then loses interest in whatever the flying saucers actually are once they determine it's not the national security threat that they are most concerned about. And instead, you have Hollywood come along and in the late 40s and early 50s begin uh, the sort of alien invasion movies uh, that we now are so familiar with that begin to link for the first time the idea of uh, you know, flying saucers, aliens, you know, visiting Earth, invasion, et cetera, et cetera. And it creates this fascinating feedback loop that then plays out decade by decade for the next 80 years where you have public sightings drive national security panics by the government that then inspire Hollywood to sort of new threats and new pop culture use of aliens uh, that then inspires more public sightings of UFOs, that inspires more national security panics and sort of ad infinitum. And uh, this is the point where I actually come to answer your question. Um, the, uh, what you see is sort of science begin to have this really difficult dance where uh, this is just also in the, the real dawn of serious uh, astronomy, you know, government-supported radio astronomy, uh, you know, exploration of the heavens in a, in a much more systematic way than we've ever seen before. Again, actually much of it driven by World War II technologies like radar, and that scientists, you know, are trying to sort of downplay the possibilities of aliens visiting Earth on the one hand while beginning to get really excited about the possibilities of life elsewhere. Um, and sort of the middle third of this book ends up being this, uh, uh, this sort of intellectual feud over decades between J. Allen Hynek, who is the astronomer who leads the government investigation of UFOs, uh, and, uh, and Carl Sagan, who is, of course, the sort of famous, most famous astronomer of the 20th century, and is simultaneously the lead voice for SETI, for the search for extraterrestrial intelligence out there, while also being the arch skeptic that aliens are actually visiting us here on Earth. So this is a presidential, uh, presidential library and museum, so I think it's only appropriate that we ask about the presidents and UFOs. So you write in your book uh, in, in quite some detail uh, with regard to kind of the disparate views of quite a few American presidents and this, the UFO issue. Um, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton. Can you expound and, and talk a little bit about each of those presidents and what they did or did not do for the UFO issue? Yeah, um, so the, the thing that will sort of most surprise uh, most of you who think that you know something about Gerald Ford in this room is that Gerald Ford in Congress was the leading advocate for studying UFOs. Um, that actually in the summer of 1966, uh, he was a congressman here. Uh, he was the minority leader in the House. And in the summer of 66, there is a very famous series of UFO sightings at Hillsdale College here in Michigan. Um, and it goes on for a period of uh, about a week. Um, there's one sort of very famous sighting at Hillsdale, uh, this glowing orb out in the forest behind one of the dorms that's witnessed by 
uh, dozens and scores of students and college administrators and police officers, uh, then a series of other UFO sightings across uh, central Michigan um, at farms, a couple of other locations. Uh, J. Allen Hynek, this uh, astronomer, is dispatched by the Air Force up to investigate it. And he spends a couple of days going around with the Army and, and police uh, across Michigan uh, trying to understand what's happening. And he eventually holds a press conference at the Detroit Press Club, and it's the largest press event ever at the Detroit Press Club, where he diagnoses the UFO sightings and dismisses them as swamp gas. And it becomes one of the most sort of infamous government dismissals of UFO sightings in history. And uh, if, you, if you don't know your uh, biology, swamp gas is a real thing. It has to do with like methane melting in the winter and then being released through the ice as the spring thaw happens. Um, and Gerald Ford, the local congressman, is uh, incredulous that the government would so quickly dismiss his obviously correct constituents who saw UFOs. And so he pushes for the first ever congressional hearings on UFOs in the summer of 1966 that end up uh, uh, being the first congressional hearings and only congressional hearings until the congressional hearings two summers ago um, when Congress sort of picked back up this, uh, this issue uh, as uh, I said in sort of my opening answer, the, uh, as we sort of began to see serious people in Washington talking seriously about this. Gerald Ford runs, of course, in 76 against Jimmy Carter, who uh, is, uh, has the best documented UFO sighting of any uh, American president. He was, when he was governor of Georgia, saw a UFO, what he thought was a UFO, outside of an Elks Club uh, one night while he was speaking as governor. And uh, it took until about a decade ago to figure out what he actually saw, which was he saw a uh, military missile test uh, over the horizon that released a barium cloud that sort of lit up the sky in this very peculiar way. Uh, and uh, Jimmy Carter, in exactly the way you would expect Jimmy Carter to be, dutifully filled out the paperwork to report a UFO sighting and sent it in um, a, 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 when he was governor, and it becomes sort of part of uh, his presidential campaign because everyone uh, at that point hopes that Jimmy Carter will win and then open up the government's secret UFO files, which he then uh, does not do. <laughs> yeah. So let's, let's talk about your alma mater, Harvard. Uh, there are a couple of interesting lines in your book, as well as the great story relating to Carl Sagan and his career track nearly being ruined uh, by his initial interest in, in UFOs, as well as another famed Harvard psychologist, Dr. Mack. Um, you write, uh, asked whether, um, when asked at the time whether Harvard was embarrassed uh, by Professor Mack, a Harvard spokesman stated that all of its faculty had strange interests, and quote, they are all weird and embarrassing one way or another. <laughs> Can you talk about, not Harvard, but this issue with Sagan and, and Dr. Mack? Yeah, so John Mack, um becomes uh, one of the sort of most fascinating characters of ufology in the 1990s as he uh, pioneers really the scientific study of people who report alien abductions. And I spend a couple of chapters of the book looking at the phenomenon of alien abductions. Uh, and uh, what, what Mac uh, really comes to understand, and then there are a couple of other people in this world who, who sort of study this, uh, um, actually a, a very famous artist named Bud Hopkins, who's a writer in his own way, who 
uh, gets interested in this, um, a couple of others. And uh, John Mack calls them experiencers because he does not want to prejudge one way or another what actually happened to these people. And that alien abductions really uh, uh, come to the fore of this in the late 1960s uh, and then really peak in the 1980s, early 90s. And the, the psychiatrists who study them uh, really believe that something happens to these people. Um, and that they report all of the signs of trauma that would be consistent with people who have undergone actual trauma. Um, it, you know, they line up uh, psychiatrically sort of very similar to abuse victims, uh, you know, uh, war veterans, um, you know, sort of other people who have variations of what we now call PTSD, and that they uh, have no, interestingly, no shared sort of psychopathy before reporting an experience and no shared psychopathy after. So this is not a situation where you see, you know, people who are schizophrenic who then report alien abductions or people who report alien abductions then go on to be diagnosed as bipolar, that there um, are sort of this very wide spectrum of experiencers uh, and that as far as sort of mental health treatment and psychiatrists can say, something happens to them and we don't know what it is. That leads me into my next question. And, and this is a question I, I guarantee that this question has never been asked at the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Museum, and I can guarantee it, it never will again. Uh, so Garrett, chapter 41, sex with aliens. Expound. <laughs> Expound, please, sir. Yeah. Um, so this... Uh, you sort of see two, two very different populations of people who report uh, encounters or experiences uh, with aliens. Um, and and uh, there's this wave of people in the 1950s that are uh, called the contactees. Um, and... Uh, they are people who come forward to sort of say, like, I have, I have had this encounter with an alien being. Uh, some of them say that they've, you know, been taken on rides with spaceships and, you know, gotten to see tours of the universe and uh, that they have been given messages to share with humanity. And it's always a message about, you know, peace and we should get along and not have nuclear war. It's a very specific 1950s uh, sort of psychological moment. And a lot of them report, you know, basically the equivalent of like the alien stops by every Thursday and we have tea together. Um, and they, for the most part, go on to attempt to like monetize this experience. You know, they, um, there's a lot of grifting involved in this of, you know, setting up some, you know, facilities and things that most people would consider cults and um, things like that. And the contactees are, are generally uh, sort of written off as, as kooks and, and dismissed. Um, one of them uh, sort of very famously uh, uh, his wife ends up divorcing him and cites the alien being uh, that he says continues to visit him as the sort of aggrieved extra party in their divorce. Um, and it's the only known time in divorce court that an alien has ever been cited uh, in legal papers as the sort of all other party 
uh, in a divorce proceeding. And then you have this other population of, of, of the experiencers, and that they, by and large, are people who have solo encounters and then just go on with their lives. Um, and, and it's a much more interesting, to me, phenomenon um, because most of them have no reason to report the encounter that they have, and actually a lot of reason that you, you would not want to report the encounters that these people have. Um, and some of them are abduction stories, um, but then you also have, there's, uh, um, there's one sort of particularly, to me, credible witness that I talk about in the book, um, who's a policeman in uh, Socorro, New Mexico in 1964. His name is Lonnie Zamora, and he's a small town cop uh, chasing a speeder in the desert, uh, on the, in the road uh, out into the desert. He knows who the speeder is. You know, he's a good small town cop, so he knows it's like the kid that he normally has a lot of trouble with. He hears an explosion off in the desert and sees what he thinks is a overturned white car off in the desert. So he abandons his pursuit. He knows he can show up at that kid's house later uh, and, and get him. And he sort of turns his Pontiac cruiser off and is like bumping up and down through the gullies towards this uh, overturned car. There are two figures standing outside of it. And as he gets closer, they get into the craft. Uh, he describes it sort of football shaped as he gets closer. Uh, and the craft takes off. And something happens to Lonnie Zamora in that desert. There is a New Mexico state trooper who shows up on the scene within a couple of minutes, sees Lonnie Zamora sort of shaken and upset by whatever this encounter is that he has had. There's some circumstantial evidence that the military and the FBI respond to the scene and find marks in the desert where the craft a craft sat or appeared to have sat where Lonnie Zamora said that it was. And that uh, he is considered to be, by the government investigators, sort of one of the most credible witnesses that we have, um, in part because he has no reason to make up this story and then just goes on with the rest of his life and never has another you know, encounter or experience uh, to report. Um, you know, there's a very simple explanation for what Lonnie Zamora saw, which is, this is 1964, uh, he, it's adjacent to the White Sands Proving Grounds, it's the heart of the Apollo program. Um, maybe he stumbled across the Air Force testing a lunar lander um, in the desert there that he just wasn't supposed to see. Uh, but, you know, we're 50, 60 years later, and there has never emerged any evidence of any craft that the U.S. government has ever created that behaves anything like the capabilities of what he says that he saw in the desert that day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think it would be remiss uh, if we did not talk about one of the most famous cases uh, in UFO history, um, and that is the issue surrounding Roswell. Um, can you talk a little bit about the Roswell situation in 47 and then the Roswell situation much later? Yeah. Um, so Roswell is almost instantly forgotten. Uh, it, is, it, it occurs, as I said, about two weeks after uh, the age of the flying saucer begins. It's part of this series of events that you see uh, across the country in the summer of 47. This rancher comes in to the city of Roswell and reports, uh, I found wreckage of a crash on my ranch. Um, the Air Force sends two officers out to investigate it, bring the wreckage back to the Roswell Army Air Force Base. And the 
commander of the Roswell base looks at it and said, he thinks this is a really great moment. And he goes, you know, great. The government has finally found one of these flying saucers that's in the newspaper every day. And he tells his public affairs officer to put out a press release saying the government recovered a flying saucer, which they do. And they pack up the wreckage and they put it on a plane, cargo plane to the 8th Air Force headquarters in, uh, in Fort Worth, Texas, where someone else looks at it and says, you idiots, this is a weather balloon. <laughs> and in about three and a half hours, uh, the military puts out a second statement saying, you know, our apologies, it's not a flying saucer, it's a weather balloon. And the Roswell story comes and goes in about three hours and is basically forgotten for 30 years and really reemerges only in the wake of Watergate in the late 1970s. And, you know, the, one of the things that really surprised me in working on this book was, as Joel said, my previous book was A History of Watergate. And this book, in some ways, ends up being a weird sequel to a book on Watergate because the second half of the book ends up being a lot about the rise of UFO conspiracy theories and the collapse of faith and trust and truth in government institutions. And so the UFO conspiracies become really the first government conspiracies to rise in the wake of Watergate, the Church Committee, the Pike Committee, Vietnam, the Pentagon Papers in the 70s and 80s, and really establishes the concept that we would now recognize as the deep state in the American political spectrum and, 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 and American politics, sort of this idea that there is this shadowy, permanent government cabal you know, secretly working at the heart of uh, the U.S. government at cross purposes with its leadership figureheads and the American public. And that you see this story grow and become darker and uh, more conspiratorial and, and sort of more poisonous over the course of the 1980s uh, and it morphs into this idea that the government has recovered, you know, multiple spacecraft, multiple aliens, uh, you know, dead aliens, living aliens, that we have peace treaties with alien civilizations. Um, there's, you know, one set of these conspiracies that we actually had a big, that the U.S. Special Forces have a big shootout with a alien base in uh, the U.S. Southwest that leads to dozens of deaths of U.S. troops. Um, and that this really becomes, I think, the beating heart of the conspiracy movement that we now recognize, uh, you know, poisoning a lot of our politics. So... The UFO conspiracy issue, the UFO sightings, this is not only an American phenomenon, uh, as you write in your book in quite quite excellent detail. This is a global phenomenon. Um, you, you talk about the Soviet Union uh, investigations. You talk about France and Belgium, the UK. Uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the experiences that the global community has had with this issue? Yeah, and, and this is also, um, you know, the, the question that everyone asks when I sort of start talking about working on this book is, are UFOs real? And the short answer is, like, of course. Like, it, all a UFO actually is is an unidentified flying object, and there are lots of those. Um, it, the question that people actually mean when they ask, are UFOs real, is, are we alone? And th that becomes, in many ways, the, the you know, intellectual and sort of philosophical beating heart of this book. And this question of, are we alone, is, 
in many ways, probably one of the two or three most profound and basic questions of human existence. You know, it, it is up there with uh, what happens to us after death. You know, is there a God? You know, these are the, the questions that you can imagine basically humans asking for as long as humanity has existed. And one of the things that you see, uh, as you said, Joel, is that you know, this is not just an American phenomenon, that many cultures uh, around the, uh, the planet sort of have meaningful UFO sightings, and that uh, you know, there are government studies in uh, the Soviet Union, France has a, has a big one, the Costa Rican government has actually taken the clearest uh, photo of a UFO that anyone has ever seen. Um, it was, and it, it, this becomes sort of something that you see really take place all over the world. Um, but this question, what's also interesting as you get into this is the question of are we alone turns out to be a very modern one and also a very Western and Christian one because many Eastern traditions have sort of always assumed that there are other beings and intelligent life and sort of a multitude of worlds out there. And in fact, actually, Harry Reid in the modern incarnation, one of the reasons he funds the modern Pentagon UFO studies is he's Mormon. And in the Mormon faith tradition, you believe actively in the possibility of other worlds and other beings. And one of the things that you really see change in the last 25 years, which I, uh, I talk about in the book, because to me this is one of the, like, the greatest revolutions in human understanding that we have seen, is that the math is on the side of the aliens. That we, as late as the 1990s, did not understand that there was a single planet outside of our own solar system. And that we now understand that effectively, every star in the universe has planets, and that a huge number of them, not necessarily a large percentage, but a huge number, just because of how huge and vast the universe is, fall into what scientists call the Goldilocks zone, which is planets that are not too hot, not too cold, could support water, could support an atmosphere, could support life as we, as we would recognize it. And that in rough numbers, the current estimate is that there are one sextillion habitable planets across the universe, which is a billion trillion habitable planets. So you can believe that life is rare, you can believe that intelligent life is rare, but is it really a one in sextillion chance? And then you get into sort of these very interesting and sort of related questions which is life could be common, intelligent life could be common, and it could still be too far away for us to know right now, or we could be functionally alone right now. That sort of part of the mind-bending math of the universe as we now understand it is that we are an incredibly young civilization in an incredibly young solar system in a very old universe, that our solar system is about four billion, four and a half billion years old in a 14 billion year old universe. And the way that the James Webb Space Telescope has revolutionized our understanding of stars and for, uh, star formation and planetary formation is that the James Webb Space Telescope has found now stars that began to form within 300 million years of the start of the universe. So you're left with this possibility 
that there could be billion-year civilizations that have risen and fallen, civilizations so much more advanced that we would not be able to even recognize them that have come and gone before our solar system ever began to gather out of dust. And it leads to this really weird sort of thought experiment, which is that we probably totally misunderstand first contact. That Hollywood and pop culture has given us sort of the three scenarios for what our first sign of an intelligent alien civilization would be. And that they're sort of all unambiguous and clear. There's the Independence Day flying saucer over the White House, take me to your leader, I'm here for friendship or to harvest your organs for energy. <laughs> There's the Jodie Foster contact radio message from outer space. And there's the E.T. sort of stranded lone traveler situation. And what's most likely to happen is something that we will probably first uh, see an intelligent civilization in a much more ambiguous and puzzling way. And we are most likely to first see a piece of space trash that we're going to have some, you know, telescope photo where we see something that we recognize is not ours, but we don't know whose it is. And that it's uh, Harvard uh, astronomy chair Avi Loeb talks about it as ba basically the equivalent of an empty plastic bag blowing through our cosmic backyard. That we're going to look up and we're going to say, that's not from our Walmart. Whose Walmart do you think that's from? And we're not going to know whether it's a civilization that's close by. We're not going to know whether it's still around. We're not going to know whether it's friendly or not friendly. But that our idea that aliens are actually going to cross interstellar space and come visit us actually is probably wrong. That we are probably not of any interest to any intelligent civilization that could master interstellar communication or travel. And that we, this idea that sort of anyone would bother stopping in on Earth uh, is probably wrong. And that you see scientists like Carl Sagan, who again, arch proponent of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence out there, and also arch skeptic of the UFOs visiting us, his argument was never aliens don't visit Earth. It's that aliens would treat Earth the way we treat a rest area on the Jersey Turnpike. That it's a place you stop on the way from one interesting stop to another. And that statistically, Aliens probably visit Earth every 100,000 to 200,000 years, just based on how you would sort of expect patterns of interstellar travel to unfold. And so it's not that aliens don't visit Earth, was Carl Sagan's argument. It's that the thing that you saw out your window last Tuesday night is unlikely to be the one night of these 200,000 years that an alien happened to stop by on their way to something far more interesting than us. So I'm going to ask one more question, and then we're going to turn it over to the audience. Uh, Garrett, this book is uh, quite a lot of things. Uh, it's uh, part Cold War history, uh, part science, part an examination of conspiracies that you had mentioned. But what is the one thing that, throughout all of your research in doing this great book, was part of that kind of wow factor? What, what really wowed you in all of your research? So I think to me it was uh, this idea, uh, as, as I said, that the math is on the side of the aliens, um, which is just a sort of tremendously revolutionary idea. Um, and that understanding how much of this subject is really a spiritual question as much as it is a scientific one or a national security one. Um, 
and uh, you know to to sort of cut to the 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 conclusion um you know one of the things that you you really begin to understand as you get into this is that in some ways aliens could be the least interesting answer to what ufos actually are um and that what uh you know so the government now calls these UAPs, um, unidentified anomalous phenomenon. The the irony, of course, is actually that they started off as flying saucers. Uh, the government, the military, came up with and popularized the term UFOs to destigmatize the conversation around flying saucers. Fast forward a couple of decades, now the government has come up with unidentified anomalous phenomenon to destigmatize. The conversation around UFOs, but also to capture two shifts in the perspective of the way that the government looks at this. One is not all of these are objects. Some chunk of them are phenomena, and not all of them are flying. That actually one of the big things that the government is now focused on as part of its renewed interest in UFOs and UAPs is USOs, uh, unidentified submerged objects or un unidentified swimming objects. And one of the things that the government has actually uh, discovered, and that we actually know because the Pentagon has talked about it, is in its study of UAPs in the modern, in the last couple of years, it discovered uh, a heretofore unknown transmedium Chinese drone, which is to say a Chinese drone that comes out of the water and transitions to flight, which is a technology that the US did not realize China had until it began to get into this modern UAP study. So when you look at what UAPs probably are, I think it's four categories. Um, it is, uh, advanced adversary technology being tested against us, which are Chinese drones, Russian drones, you know, whatever uh, Tony Stark is building in some mountain lab that we, we don't know about. Some chunk of it is a uh, highly scientific term called weird stuff. <laughs> and that's the, there's just a bunch of weird stuff floating around up there in the sky that we don't really pay attention to on a daily basis. Uh, and this is what we ended up with with the Chinese spy balloon last year, which is if you turn the NORAD radars sort of slightly differently, you pick up a bunch of balloons and junk and we panic as a country and we sent up the world's most advanced fighter jet to shoot it all down with a quarter million dollar missiles and uh, this, this is real, we shot down, uh, one of the things we shot down was a uh, hobbyist balloon from the Northern Illinois Balloon Brigade's Meteorology Club. <laughs> um, that just we didn't know was up there. Um, and then you get into sort of two other categories that I think are the real interesting stuff, which is meteorological, atmospheric, and uh, astronomical science and phenomenon that we don't understand yet. That I think one of the great lessons of science of the last couple of years, the last few decades, is that we should be really humble about our understanding of the world. And that the world is probably much weirder than we think it is. And that we, I think, have a bias that we understand a lot more of the world than we actually do. And then when you begin to go back and you realize how, just how much of our knowledge is really new. You know, uh, um, George Washington lived and died not knowing that dinosaurs existed. Um, until 1847, the gorilla by Western science was considered a mythical creature akin to the Yeti or the unicorn before it was ever actually spotted by Western science and explorers. You go to the 1950s, we did not understand 
plate tectonics, you know, the basics of how our, um, our own Earth moves. We still know, you know, as everyone says, we know less about the bottom of the ocean than we do the surface of the moon. And you want to know something fascinating about how little we know about the moon? We have not even looked on the moon to know whether there are other lunar landers elsewhere on the moon that are not ours. Like, we've never even done a comprehensive study of the moon's surface at a resolution uh, detailed enough to know whether there are other lunar landers from other civilizations on our own moon. This is not me saying, I think that there are other lunar landers on the moon. This is me saying, like, this is how nascent our study of a lot of these phenomenon actually are. And then you get to the last category, which is the truly, truly weird stuff, which is physics that we don't understand. And the idea of, you know, real revolutions in physics that people theorize about right now, but that we don't yet understand. I mean, this could be really mind-bending stuff. You know, interdimensional travel, parallel universes, time travel from the past or future. Things that would, to us, be even weirder than aliens visiting but that we don't yet necessarily understand at a theoretical level. And you say, like, no, we get physics, like we know there are no parallel dimensions, there's no time travel. The world's oldest woman died last year. She was a French nun. She was 118 years old. Everything that humanity knows about relativity and quantum physics was discovered in her lifetime. Imagine what we will learn about physics in the next human lifespan. Imagine what we could learn in 500 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years. There's an Italian astrophysicist, uh, Carlo Rivelli, who has a new book out. Uh, I'm not a physicist, so I'm about to butcher a very complex theory that he has. But it's his proposal for the idea of white holes not black holes, but white holes. We've never seen one, but he theorizes that they exist. And it's his explanation for what happens at the bottom of a black hole, which is at the bottom of a black hole, he theorizes the black hole bounces and effectively rewinds and time reverses and everything that ever entered into the black hole is then expelled. And he says, of course, we've never seen this. But when he came to his first uh, senior level astrophysics appointment in the year 2000, his department chair pulled him aside and said, you don't really believe in black holes, do you? Because in 2000, we'd never seen one. And we now understand the universe is populated wildly with them. And yet there's sort of still so much that we don't understand about this world around us, the answers of which could be, again, far weirder than mere aliens. Garrett, thank you so much. Questions from the audience, please. We have about 15 minutes. Anybody? Down here? I think we've got a mic coming around. Got a mic com we have a mic coming around. Uh, I was just wondering what you thought about the Travis Walton incident, if you know about that. Yeah. And all the different studies of each person that was there and confirmed. Yeah, um, this is the uh, incident that, the, that Fire in the Sky, the movie, w was originally based on. Um, uh, it, you know, it's... A, it's uh, it, it's a it's a weird incident. Um, you know, there there's reasons to doubt some of what uh, unfolded there. Uh, it's certainly one of the um, uh, it, it, it's certainly sort of one of the biggest sightings or encounters that we see um, in the last uh, 
you know, 25, 30, 40 years. Um, and I think was a really big part of that flywheel that I was talking about of how pop culture incidents sort of inspire more sightings that inspire more pop culture. Um, and that, you know, I, I don't, part of the challenge with a lot of this is it's going to be really hard to go back on and untangle almost any of the encounters that have been reported over the years because we just don't have the data that one would want to be able to sort of trace back what actually happened in individual encounters. Um, and so uh, Avi Loeb, the Harvard astronomy chair that I mentioned earlier, the thing that he's trying to do right now is he just last fall opened the first UAP observatory to try to document the like basics of you know what an ordinary sky looks like um, to try to establish the like baselines of data collection that you would want to begin to try to investigate sort of further encounters like, uh, like that one whenever they happen in the future and we'll have a better understanding of sort of like what's weird and what's not weird. Yeah. What about the Navy pilots? What's yeah. The, uh, everything was well documented. Yeah, so the, the Navy pilots, uh, the, the, um, you know, to me fall into this Lonnie Zamora category of, you know, super highly credible witnesses. Uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons if you are a uh, Navy aviator, a Navy fighter pilot, that you, in fact, don't want to be the person who comes back to the aircraft carrier and says, you wouldn't believe the UFO I just ran across. Um, and that, uh, you know, they, they have what are sort of considered the best types of encounters. Because you have a credible witness backed up with external, you know, video, radar, you know, instrument readings. And they are, you know, they have been a big part of restarting this conversation since 2017. Um, and their work is, it, it, those, those encounters um, take place, or they've sort of been turned over to this new Pentagon office called Arrow that is really trying to make sense of what the government considers UAP sightings. Um, you know, part of the, the challenge is there's a, what are considered public UFO sightings are generally not that interesting. Um, you know, the vast majority of uh, public UFO sightings are easily explained. Um, you know, the planet Venus is actually a really large percentage of public UFO sightings because it's just such a bright star in a weird place in the sky. How many, how many of them come from B2s, well, U2s, F-117s? So then there's, you know, what the public considers UFO sightings are often actually also secret U.S. government test projects. Um, a big chunk of what we now understand were UFO sightings in the 1950s were the U-2 spy plane being tested and developed by the CIA and the Air Force. And, you know, that in the years since has been the, you know, SR-71, the A-12 ox cart, the stealth fighter, the stealth bomber. Um, you know, the stealth B-21 bomber just had its first test flight in November last fall. So, like, these programs are still out there. The question to me is what are the sightings that the U.S. government thinks are UFO sightings? And what are the ones that they can't explain? And that number over time is somewhere between as high as 20% and generally is considered closer to about 5% that the government itself can't explain. And Arrow, in its work with the Navy pilots and other encounters, uh, 
it, it finds about 2% of UFO sightings it cannot explain with, you know, known, uh, known, uh, known phenomenon, known test flights, um, known, uh, you know, other man-made technology. And, and to me, of course, like, whatever is interesting in the answer to the mystery of UFOs and UAPs is in that 2% of sightings that the government itself can't explain. I was wondering what your access is to find out things like there was a video uh, line or on cable of these figures that were supposedly f photographed at Roswell. They look like aliens. Do you get to look into that? Do you do you have access to anything like that that you yeah. know about? So I think um, uh I actually find Roswell one of the least interesting UFO uh, sightings. Um, and I find it uninteresting for the following reason, which a lot of people don't put together, which is the most famous conversation in ufology is something called the Fermi Paradox, which is Enrico Fermi, the physicist, uh, is having lunch with uh, his colleagues at Los Alamos National Lab in the summer of 1950 with uh, it, um, Edward Teller. Um, there's a third scientist with them. If you know your Oppenheimer uh, movie from the last year, these are all the people who were involved, uh, names that are familiar. And they're talking about a New Yorker cartoon so that's how we're able to date this conversation to the summer of 1950. Uh, that uh, has, th there had been a, a series of stories about alien, or sorry, uh, about garbage cans missing from New York City streets. And the cartoon is about aliens getting off a flying saucer, carrying their souvenirs from visiting Earth of these New York City um, trash cans. And they're talking over lunch, and Enrico uh, Fermi says, uh, if life is so common, where are they? And it, it, it's, you know, now known as the Fermi paradox, which is if life is as common as we think it is, why don't we see more of it? Why don't we... Why, you know, why do we have no sign of it? And the thing that people miss about Roswell is that in the summer of 1947, if the U.S. government had recovered an alien spacecraft or an alien body, alive or dead, it wouldn't have gone, as a lot of people think, to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, which is where the Air Force Intelligence is located. And there's sort of this long-standing conspiracy that there's a hangar at Wright-Patterson where the alien spacecraft are kept. It would have gone to Los Alamos National Lab, which was right up the road from Roswell, and which was where the government had already assembled all of the smartest physicists in the United States to address the biggest questions of physics. If we encountered an alien spacecraft the summer of 47, even if that had been kept incredibly secret, if there were 10 people in the United States who knew about that craft and had been asked to provide advice about it, there's no way Enrico Fermi was not one of those 10. That if anyone in America knew that we had recovered a spacecraft in the summer of 47, Fermi and Teller would have been among that group. And they were at the base where the US government would have almost absolutely put that. So if in the summer of 1950, 
three years later, Enrico Fermi is sitting there saying, well, we haven't seen any evidence of any aliens yet, have we? Um, to me, that's actually the most convincing evidence that nothing interesting happened in Roswell in 47. One more question. Mine's kind of a dual question. The first one is I'm going to ask you back what you ask us about. Um, do you believe in aliens? And if you do, do you think they're more regional or more further out there? And then the other one is um, what are your thoughts from before you wrote the book, what you thought about aliens and UFOs, to after you wrote the book? Yeah. So, uh, um, I think that, and, and basically all of my views on this have been shaped by this book. I came into this book with very little, uh, you know, n knowledge or understanding of, of this, uh, of this subject, um, which is, you know, the fun of researching and writing a book. Um, I think that a, a intelligent civilizations exist across the universe. Um, I'm pretty dubious that they are close enough that we will know. Um, and to me, the, there's this sort of amazing hope and optimism that underlies the search for extraterrestrial intelligence that I think is really important to sort of capture and live in our daily lives which is that these scientists who work on this subject um, you know, are embarking on studies that probably none of them will ever live to see to fruition. You know, that these are 10,000 year, 100,000 year, million year projects that they are getting started in trying to understand where we fit into the scope and scale of the universe. And when the group, the sort of founding scientists of SETI came together at the National uh, Radio Astronomy uh, uh, Observatory in Green Bank, West Virginia, in the first meeting, they came up with what's called the Drake Equation, um, which is sort of the most famous equation in, in SETI. And it, Fra this guy, Frank Drake, uh, comes up with it and it's an equation that lays out the variables for how, how common life and intelligent life would probably be across the universe. And, you know, it's how many planets are habitable. On what percentage of planets that are habitable uh, does life uh, evolve? You know, what, what, on what percentage of planets that are habitable do it does intelligent life um, evolve out of life um, and and on and on through this equation the most important variable is called L and L is the length of time an intelligent civilization lasts and everything in SETI hinges on L and if L is a few 10,000 years, 100,000 years, uh, we are functionally alone. You know, the, life could happen all the time, intelligent life could happen uh, all the time, and every time it appears, it's going to be functionally alone in the universe because civilizations just don't last long enough to overlap with one another. If L is a million years or a billion years, our universe will teem with intelligent life. To me, from the human experience right now, where we're sitting in 2024, there's a lot of reasons to be pretty wary that L is very long. And that, you know, which is like half of a joke and like half not a joke, which is, you know, you're looking around today, there's a lot of reasons to think like we're not here 10,000 years from now. Um, I hope that we are. 
And I think that sort of one of the reasons that humanity should take really seriously, like living through these next couple of decades and figuring out the really big questions that we have to figure out to keep this planet livable and habitable over the next couple of decades and centuries is because we have a lot invested in trying to make L as big as possible. And that, you know, we are right now just like a total blip on the cosmic radar. And there's a lot of pretty amazing stuff that humanity could figure out if we give ourselves the chance for another 10,000 years, another 100,000 years, another million years. You know, the average lifespan for a species on Earth is about five million years. And, you know, we're in the tens of thousands for our species right now. You know, like, imagine what five million years of humanity could achieve um, and what that could mean for what L could look like across the rest of the universe. Well, before Gleaves closes the show, ladies and gentlemen, Garrett Graff. Stay here. All right. Garrett and Joel, thank you for a very enlightening and entertaining evening. I think this was just amazing. Uh, you know, I felt as if we were at times in a sort of a church gathering, a, and then a NASA seminar, and then a pop culture confab. I mean, it covered the whole gamut. And as a token of appreciation to you, and this is much heavier than our typical gift, <laughs> it, it's a moon rock from the New York City trash can that was recovered. <laughs> No, this is phenomenal. Thank you. This is great. Oh, this was just wonderful. You know, these events are made possible because of the great planning of our partners at the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum, our foundation, the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation has a role in this as well. And we're very, very proud to be able to offer these kinds of programs. And I want to alert you to the fact that we have some empty seats here. We need more friends of Ford in here, right? I mean, just think of all the friends you know who could be here and enjoying what we heard tonight. We have some incredible programs coming up, and we hope that you'll be able to bring your friends to them. A week from tonight, for example, Joe Jones, isn't it a week from tonight? Joe Jones is going to be coming back. Remember last year? How many of you came to the Joe Jones concert last year? Yeah. A number of you. Well, he's going to come back with a very, very provocative talk on the music, the songs that healed America. Think of that, how evocative that is. Also, every Tuesday evening in February and March, we are partnering with the World Affairs Council for West Michigan, and we're going to have a great talk from somebody who's an expert on some area of the world. I mean, this is going to be like a, a tour of National Geographic combined with, you know, a wild kingdom in parts. So you'll want to be here for that. I also just want to point out that we have a couple of special people in the audience. It's always a treat when we have actual members of the Ford family who are with us. Uh, Bob and Karen, thanks so much for being here this evening. I, Uncle Jerry and Aunt Betty would be proud. Well, I'm going to go home a very satisfied customer, and I hope you do, too. Good night. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a uh, foundation. Uh, we have uh, Garrett going to be signing some books uh, outside. So please, if you're interested in buying a book and having Garrett sign it, get in line. <laughs>